Good evening. Well, here anyway. Welcome to this webinar, which is the second staged by the Project on Populism and Constitutional Democracy, funded by the Australian Research Council, together with the UNSW University of New South Wales, Law Faculty's Network for Interdisciplinary Study of Law. Yesterday, many of us endured around the world an hour and a half of an exemplary political catastrophe, cacophony, that wasn't irrelevant to our subject and might come up in our discussion. But tonight, instead of Joe and Donald, we have an altogether superior cast, Ivan and Stephen, and the discussion is bound to be both more edifying and more enlightening than that from yesterday. Our subject is a remarkable and challenging book, The Light That Failed. Uh, the UK version subtitle is A Reckoning, and the US imprint is How the West is Losing the Fight for Democracy. Neither subtitle is full of good cheer, but if we're to understand our global predicament and start thinking about how we got into it and how we might get out of it, we could go nowhere better than to this book and to these authors. Ivan Krastev is chairman of the Center for Liberal Strategies in Sofia, Bulgaria, and he's permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences uh, in Vienna. And Stephen Holmes is Walter E. Meyer, professor of law at NYU Law School. They're both with us now, Ivan from Sofia and Stephen, heroically, up and awake at 5 a.m. in New York. As in our first uh, webinar, the discussants are the three chief investigators of the project, the Populism Project, Adam Chalmota, Associate Professor of Law at UNSW. He's presently in Bialystok in Poland. Wojciech Sadurski, Chalice Professor of Jurisprudence at Sydney University. And me, Martin Krieger, Professor of Law and Social Theory at UNSW. We're both at the moment in Sydney. The Life That Failed is scintillating in style and in substance. It's a marvelous read, and it delivers its ominous message sparkling prose and in sometimes acerbic, often painfully uncomfortable, insights. It represents a huge challenge to the ways that many of us, including its authors, I think, have thought about politics and geopolitics, at least over the past 30 odd years, and they have been odd years. The book is a meditation on a variety of permutations of a single tightly argued theme that we've been living in a 30 year old age of imitation played out among the major centers of power and contention in the modern world, Central Europe, Russia, United States, and China. And that this age is coming to a close. Ivan and Stephen argue that this fact underpins, or these facts, many of the most significant and portentous developments of the late 20th and early 21st century, and here we are, poised at a moment when the age of liberal imitation, as they write, is over, but the age of illiberal imitation uh, may have just begun. The book deals with so much and travels so far in its re relatively short span that we could spend all night or whatever the sun is doing in your time discussing any of its major foci, whether it be Central European populism, Russian reactions to the West, American reactions to others' reactions, China's resurgence in the world, and what all of this adds up to, but we won't spend all night, partly out of compassion for you, the audience, partly to allow Stephen to go back to bed, and partly to give Wojciech time to prepare for his next Zoom meeting, which is closely connected to one of our subjects today, and which takes place tomorrow. He will star, as he so often does, in the latest court case of several brought against him by various arms of the Polish government, this time a charge of criminal defamation brought by the government's own recidivist criminal defamer, the television propaganda cha channel TVP. If you happen to be in the area of the dist district court of Mokotov, criminal division in Warsaw tomorrow around noon, and if you get a COVID clearance, you might drop in. I'm sure you'll be welcome. Otherwise, no doubt, we will read about it soon, and we hope and we trust. And since the Polish courts, particularly lower courts, have not yet been totally suborned by the government, it'll be good news. And one last thing before we get to work. As last time, we're truly delighted that so many of you have turned up from all over the world for this event. That means, again, that we've not been able to feature on the screen, 
and have had to formalize Q&A somewhat. And that formalization is that those who wish to ask a question, use the chat function, uh, either to type your question or write that you would like to speak. And Dr. Carolyn Evans, who is our project coordinator in publication behind the screen, will coordinate the questions. And if you have any technical difficulties, send a private chat to Carolyn or email her at the address on the scheme, screen. I remind you that this session is being recorded and the recording will, be, will appear in a few days on our website, globalconpop.org blog, as well as on YouTube. But let's start, uh, if it's okay with you and uh, with, with everyone here, how could it not be? Uh, the book begins with a lapidary sentence, the future was better yesterday. And I'd like to ask you both, but maybe start with Ivan, what made it look good then? And why does it look so much worse now? Listen, of course, the first sentence is also a kind of an ironic quote to something that the American vice president in 1990, Dan Quayle, said. So, as you know, Dan Quayle was not famous for his intellectual power, uh, but he was somebody uh, that was uh, in the White House when the uh, Cold War was ending. So he wanted to say the world will be better tomorrow. But he said, the future will be better tomorrow. And in fact, we believe that the future was better yesterday because in 1989, there was this kind of a general consensus around the world that we know the direction in which the world is going. The end of the Cold War was basically the end of a clash between two different kinds of universalist ideologies, very much being rooted uh, in the European Enlightenment. And one of them was not simply defeated, but in a certain way, conceded its uh, irrelevance, uh, suddenly the communism does not claim uh, the future anymore. And this was done by the fact that the leaders of the communist parties themselves, I mean, back then, uh, Gorbachev in the Soviet Union and uh, the Chinese leadership basically said the world is not going in our direction. So from this point of view, we have at least the illusion that we know the direction in which the world is going, and this direction was liberal democracies. People can very much disagree how democratic the future is going to be, but I do believe liberal democracy back then was understood to be the synonymous with modernity. To be modern, it means to be a type of a liberal democratic state of one state or another. And now we're in a different situation. So in a certain way, I do believe that we know that the world is changing and COVID-19 was a kind of a very strong signal, uh, but we don't have an idea that we know the direction of the change. I do believe we are much more in the position of uh, this famous uh, British lord who jumped on his horse and start riding in all directions in the same time. And this is why I do believe that basically the future was better yesterday. And what characterizes, what do you find characterizes this period? This is the central theme of the book. Stephen? Um, well, what is a, the age of imitation? Yeah, okay, but the, uh, another way to answer your first question, which I'll then transition to answering this one, is that the Cold War was, uh, in, the, in the European space, the Cold War was a battle between two regimes, two imperial regimes that were uh, using, were replicating themselves in their frontline states. So Europe was a place where uh, both the communist Soviet Union and the liberal America were creating replica regimes facing off each other. And when the Soviet Union collapsed and its regimes and the satellite regimes broke away, there was an illusion, a sense, and this is more or less what Ivan was saying, that the American project of replicating itself could go on forever. That it was just going to start here. It was starting here. It was starting in Central Europe. And it was going to go everywhere, including Iraq and so forth and so on. So that was a, uh, a picture of the world in which that impulse, it was just a happenstance that the, that the Cold War was a war about replicating yourself in this central space. We weren't doing that in South America and so on, but we were doing it in Europe. And since that was, the, that was the core of the Cold War confrontation, this created this illusion that the future was ours. The future was the future of our capacity to replicate ourselves around the world. So now to, tell me your second question again, because it is 5 a.m. Well, it's, you've heard the phrase because you invented it. It's about the age of imitation. Okay. What is it that, uh, I mean, that is what you say characterizes yes. it. 
the, okay, so our, one of the clues we were okay. The idea, the question we started with was why was the part of the world, Central Europe, in which liberal democracy seemed most promising, seemed like it was beginning to spread around the world. It was starting there, and it, well, the prospects were very bright. Uh, why in exactly in this part of the world have these uh, uh, populist, authoritarian, xenophobic? Uh, uh, regimes based on a, pop, uh, a politics of resentment and grievance, why have they taken over and taken power exactly in that place? And we, uh, uh, the clue with which we started, and of course it's only a partial story, we're not trying to uh, give the last word on this subject, but the clue with which we started was a theme that we kept hearing in Poland, in Hungary, and elsewhere, of we, of uh, the theme of the, the counter elite that was attacking the liberal reform project was we don't want to be copies. We don't want to be copies anymore, but we want to be ourselves. So a kind of search for authenticity against uh, what? Against a, uh, a picture that post-communist transition was going to be a project of imitative development. That is, we want to be like the West. We want to develop ourselves by imitating a Western model. And that means importing a Western model. And as uh, we say at the beginning of the book, one of the unnoticed things, if you think that of democratization and liberalization as imitation, then it makes more sense to understand, it, it makes it easier to understand why a politics of grievance can arise because imitation assumes the superiority of the model over the mimic. And therefore the whole project of imitation can create uh, the impression that we are less and you are, we are, le we are worse and you're better. And therefore, it's almost as if it implies a, a, a subordination of our culture to yours. So that's the, that's the kind of initial insight of the book. And we try to develop that. We apply it elsewhere, or, uh, not to every populist movement in the world, because we, we, we think, I, both of us and I agree, that there is something global about this anti-liberal revolt, Brazil, India, and so on. But we are focusing only on three regions. And we use the concept of imitation, which is a plastic, uh, malleable uh, uh, idea. Uh, and we try to trace it. We use it as a kind of Ariadne's thread to trace a relation between the Central European revolt, the Russian, uh, what happened in Russia, and what happened in the US. Good. And clear, it's clear in the book that even though you have a lot to say about Russia, about the US, at the end about China. The springboard of your reflections has been East Central Europe. And so I'll ask Wojciech, who has written a marvelous book on the breakdown of uh, constitutional democracy in Poland, one of your two cases, uh, and who has at the moment more skin in the game than most of us, to uh, start with uh, a response to your reflections about East Central Europe. Wojciech. Okay, thank you. Uh... So first of all, Ivan and Stephen, thank you for joining us here and my great congratulations for your book. It's a terrific book. It's, uh, I mean, of all the, <laughs> this now becoming longer and longer series of books which have the uh, death or end or crisis of democracy in their titles or subtitles, I believe that your book is easily the most inspiring, thought-provoking, stimulating, and brilliant. So it's a terrific read and everything that I'll say in a moment should be bracketed by my huge, huge and totally sincere admiration for the book. But I'm here not to praise but to offer critical commentary. Maybe, maybe I'll sharpen it a bit for the sake of discussion, which is the usual thing they say, you know. Uh, but uh, as, as Martin said, my observations are about the first chapter. So I've done more work than Martin. Martin based his question to you just on the first sentence of the book. I, I went further than that and, and, and my, my thing will be on the basis of the entire chapter one. And uh, although I think that we have some incredibly important things to say in the following chapters on Russia, on the US and on China, uh, but somehow the first chapter is in many ways foundational and uh, it permeates the entire book. So my observation is maybe first sort of like a methodological uh, 
introduction, I, it seems to me that almost all the argument and evidence which you provide in the first chapter is based on one country, that is Hungary. Occasionally you talk about Poland, but it's almost like en passant. It is very much Hungary-centered. And I just wonder whether it hasn't colored your approach, because obviously the chapter has aspirations of providing some more universal uh, insights. It's not a chapter about Hungary, it's a chapter about Central and Eastern Europe. But maybe on this particular issue, that is this sort of resentment about the imitation and mimicking and all this stuff, maybe Hungarians are somehow special. Maybe it's Hungary specific type of resentment. Maybe it goes to their more ingrained I mean, I don't want to go into some sort of psychology, but more ingrained sense that we've been particularly badly done by the world and, you know, it goes to, all to the Trianon complex, etc., which I think is not necessarily replicated in other countries, and especially in the country that I know best in the region, and that is Poland. So I must say that neither as an account of what happened in during the transition and right after 1989, nor as an explanatory theory about the collapse of liberalism and the advent of illiberal populism, neither, in, in neither of these ways, I think your theory works with regard, at least with regard to Poland. So when it comes to the first aspect, your account, account of what happened in 1989 and immediately after, I simply do not think that Poland faced this situation which you depict and lament as, uh, you know, there are no alternatives. Liberalism presented itself as a, we are the only option, there are no alternatives. There were other alternatives. There are plenty of alternatives. They were on the table. There was a post-communist slash social democratic alternative. There was a Catholic nationalist authoritarian alternatives. These were serious alternatives and there was a serious debate. And that is true that liberal democratic, fortunately, uh, alternative prevailed, but it prevailed through not some sort of disingenuous means of liberalism, which as you say at one point, you know, replaced this pluralism with hegemony. I mean, every, every theory, every doctrine which believes that it's better than others and that it provides better identification of the common good may be seen as being homogeneous because that, I mean, we, we cannot have a society sort of like utopian society of uh, like in a Nozikian sense when there are different at the same time models coexisting, at least not today, not in countries like Poland. So I don't think that it is the case there were no alternatives. I don't think it is the case that emulation was thoughtless, although I'm paraphrasing because I'm not sure you were we use this word, but I think that's the general idea. It was sort of like a thoughtless, total imitation or emulation of other models. I don't think it was. I think it was largely selective. Not everything was taken. I'm, I'm thinking about my own field, constitutional law. I mean, things were picked a little bit from the States, a little bit from Germany, a little bit from France. I mean, there, were, there was a certain deliberate mixture. And I don't think they were totally coming from the outside because they largely resonated with strong indigenous ideas and doctrines. I mean, what Jeffrey Sachs found in Warsaw when he came and, and met Balcerowicz was that Balcerowicz and his, his team had already elaborated a great deal of things before. So they resonated with some bona fide, deliberate, intelligent, work, footwork, which had been done before the transition itself. And that is true, that transition itself largely relied on emulation as a source of legitimacy. Look, we want to be like a normal world. We want to be like a normal country. And normal country was, you know, your favorite West European country. And that was an important part of the, of the legitimacy of, of changes. But it was much more, I think, deliberate and conscious and resonating with local demands uh, than you depict. And somehow all that was then replicated or all what you say about 1989 somehow prefigured 
accession to the EU, which we again describe in those terms of, okay, you know, they had to, you know, it was like an imposition, even if what were imposition in a benign sense of the word, because they were a good solution, it was an imposition. I don't think it was. I think many of us who participated in public discourse, say in Poland, thought it's a very good thing to have this sort of self-restraint imposed, this sort of golden straitjacket adopted from Brussels or Luxembourg, etc. But I don't want to delve any more about the, the, the history. I want to, 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 to say a few words about today, and that is about how the imitation thesis may account for the advent or, 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 or this renaissance or whatever you call it. Would, would it be possible to deal, to discuss the first and then you come back with the second? Sure, absolutely. If, sure. Yeah. Please, who would like to start? Okay. Okay, let's, uh, let's start. And first, thank you very much. And uh, this, this is absolutely legitimate questions, all of them. Uh, let's start first with to what extent we universalize the Hungarian experience. And you have a point, and part of the point is that Orban is the only one who basically believes that he creates a model of liberal democracy that can be exported everywhere. You remember the famous rallies of the Polish right, making Budapest in Warsaw? Yes. So from this point of view, of course, the ideological ambition coming from Hungary is stronger. But in a certain way, as a, try, a way to try to explain the rise of illiberalism, the Polish case is even more interesting than the Hungarian one. Because one of the major explanations for the success of this uh, type of political parties was its economy is stupid. Everything can be basically explained through kind of a failure of certain economic policies and the global financial crisis was very much doing this. Poland does not fit this. And as you know better than me, basically Poland was the fastest developing European economy for the last 20 years. There was no recession even in the days of the global financial crisis. And this is not simply about economic growth. There was a decline of social inequality in Poland. So even type of a uh, uh, social inequality argument is not going to explain the rise of Kaczynski and the Law and Justice Party. What is also quite important, and I was very much relying on certain studies being done by Polish sociologists, you're going to see that yes, some of the voters uh, of the law and justice can be defined as the losers of economic transition, but some of them does not fit this at all. Uh, and part of the story that they're talking about was that they had been neglected and so on, not so much in the economic sense. Uh, and also, I very much agree with you that in the early 1990s, there was at least the feeling that we are making a choice. But for us, it was very important that all these choices after a certain period of time was within the framework of liberal democracy. So for example, you can have a social democrats in Poland, but the change of policy is going to be much more limited than you can explain. Uh, and uh, uh, part of this story that you can change governments, but you're not going to change policies, is also was even much more important uh, during the European accession process, because like any accessions, you're adopting the norms that existed in the club. You're not creating them. So for us, part of the story is and where you're right when you say for many people, basically adopting these norms was really what we believed in. I very much agree with you, but there were other people in Poland for whom this was not their transition. Uh, and for us, it was extremely interesting to understand, and this is the people that claim we don't want to imitate anymore, we want to be ourselves, we are looking for Polish identity. So from this point of view, for us, it was critically important to try to make a sense of some of the claims of uh, this kind of a populist leaders. And it's interesting to see that all of them uh, were very much going there. Uh, and for us, uh, and we have, as you know, in the first chapter, very much trying to understand, for example, why imitating Germany became so difficult for many of the Central and East European countries. Because on one level, Germany was the model that everybody was fascinated with, not simply because Germany was a very prosperous liberal democracy, but also Germans went to a transformation that very much resembles that one that we got to. It was a country that reinvented itself. But secondly came, in my view, four things, and we had been writing this with uh, Stephen, that were quite difficult and basically was partially explaining this type of a new tensions. And in the case of Poland, uh, of course, the traditional German-Polish uh, kind of relations contributed even more to this. One is that the, the view of nationalism 
coming from Germany was unacceptable to big parts of the Polish population because as we claim in 1945, the nationalism was defeated in Germany, but in 1989, nationalism was part of the victorious anti-communist coalition. The nationalists didn't feel that they had been defeated in 1989 because they were seeing themselves as very important part of the anti-communist opposition and the nationalistic part of the solidarity was always there. Uh, uh, for us, interesting story is not where nation, why the, did nationalism came back. For us, the question was where it has been hiding for all these years. And part of our explanation was that it was the Yugoslav war and the connections between the ex-communist Milosevic and nationalism that muted some of these people for a while. But they didn't change their views. Even if you go on the opinion polls, you're going to see that part of the nationalistic attitudes did not change much. What changes how people were voting, the nature of the political parties, but they have been always there. The second interesting thing that became a huge uh, reaction, and we saw it also in East Germany very much, is that when Germans were trying to talk about their model, they were trying to uh, convince East Europeans not to do what the Germans did, but what they should have done. For example, between 1950 and 1965, uh, this was not dealing with the past and coping with the past that was at the center of the German experience. It came after 1968. But because the Germans believed that it was morally wrong, they went and treated Eastern Europe differently. The response of the Eastern Europe was, you have a double standards. You're, never, you're doing, pushing us to do things that you didn't do to yourself. The third is that there was no export of the social model. In a certain way, Germany itself liked their social democratic and social uh, economy state, but they didn't believe it's going to work in Central and Eastern Europe now. Uh, and as a result of it, I do believe we have this kind of a confusion. And uh, uh, the last point, uh, which uh, I do believe we're trying to make quite clear with Stephen in the book is that they estimated in our number the 1980 was the effect of a big kind of an exodus of younger, many of them liberal-minded people out of our countries who basically decided to study in the West, to work in the West, which also changed the nature of the body politics. Uh, and this is quite clear. And for example, we're showing this in the, uh, in the case of Romania, uh, that uh, suddenly the only way for the liberal candidate to win these days in many of our countries is if you have an extremely high turnout of the diaspora vote. So all these things, and this is why, uh, I, why I agree with you very much that probably our imitation story is not explaining much, but we do believe that this type of uh, imitation and resentment to imitation was totally neglected for two reasons. Either there were people saying that it was the colonization of the West by the East, something that we don't accept. Because as you said, it was our own decision. We wanted to be like the West. It's not that the West came and imposed this on us. Or people who basically come and they come either with economic explanation or this idea of the backsliding uh, of democracy, which I also don't buy because as you know, back to the term backsliding, it comes from the religious thought. And this is when somebody is newly converted, going back to kind of a bad habits, explaining everything through the political kind of tradition of these countries, in my view, uh, did not work much. So this is why for us, imitation was to try to understand the resentment outside of a simple economic explanation or simply a traditional political culture explanations. But I'm sure that Stephen has something much more interesting to say. <laughs> Oh, yes, right, exactly, in my wide awakeness. No, I just want to add a couple of things. Uh, Wojciech, you're, I think when I was listening to you, I thought you were confusing things that really happened with the way they were presented by the populace. Of course, there were alternatives, but it was presented part of the way of uh, winning popular support uh, in Poland uh, and winning support against the reform elite was to say there was no alternatives. It wasn't imposed, but... They, pre they presented it's almost, it, it was an imperial colonial imposition. It's the language. So why, how did they win support in the country? Of course, they distorted the process. There were alternatives, as you say. It was an adaptation. It wasn't just a wholesale. And all those things are correct as descriptions of what happened. But of course, filtered through the populist rhetoric, they were presented this way. No alternatives, imposition, and so forth. And I think just... One thing you can uh, uh, add, I think, very st strongly to, to what Ivan said, is that there was a sense that the post the reform elite that was so eager to join the West, as 
as you said, we wanted it. But who, what happened was, who is the we that wanted it? So there was an ability to turn against this counter elite, which rose up, was able to turn against the reform elite. The reform elite, which wanted to join a post-national Europe on a German model, which was leaving national traditions, national heroes on the ground. It wasn't stressing Poland's, uh, even though there was adaptation, it wasn't stressing putting in the center of attentions Poland. Uh, authentic national past. And that was, well, was neglected. It wasn't that they were anti-Polish, it just that wasn't the center, the central theme of the reform elite, the imitative reform elite. And this was a vulnerability which was exploited by the counter elite that rose up, the anti-liberal counter elite. That's, that's the argument. And this, I don't think it at all contradicts what you, what you said as a descriptive matter. Well, second part no, of your question. No, I, I, I really don't want to somehow monopolize. So maybe I'll come back later with my second okay. point. Okay. okay. Well, the next chapter in the book. Sorry, if I could just interpolate one thing, maybe just leave it hanging. One question that I had that relates a little to Wojciech's why do we single out Poland and Hungary is that in a lot of other East Central, Euro that Central European countries, there have been lack of success in all sorts of ways, but none of them, not none of them, few of them have been as dramatically both imitators and then populists. And so I wonder whether Poland and Hungary, which we for our sins also focus on, are too easily taken to be exemplary of a region which was subject to the same challenge and the same um, same enticements and same incentives, but didn't jump with the enthusiasm either way, either for in the same way or against in the same way. I just, I, I, we have another example, which we were talking about, that's East Germany. And the East German experience was one in which there's a lot of anguish about being imitators and being subordinated uh, to a foreign kind of, uh, Power. In that case, <laughs> there was a strong sense of being sure. coercively uh, imposed, a westernization coercively imposed. And uh, this is also, I, I like very much the uh, phrase of Alexander Golan, the AFD uh, deputy in the, uh, in, in the Bundestag, who said, and he, I like this because it shows the relevance of Central European populism to what's happening around in, in global anti-liberalism. He says, a globalist is a, is a person who when it rains in his country, he doesn't get wet. So there's a sense that there's an elite who is, has monopolized, uh, is in the first in the line for the lifeboats, who can leave our country, who is not loyal to our national community, who is uh, globally networked. Uh, and uh, this is a very strong part of uh, the populist, the internet, we'd say the populist international in a way uh, of a, uh, Often it's rural versus urban areas. Uh, it's un, un, less educated versus more educated. And so, th and that's the, the aspect of our story which seems to be, uh, have a kind of universal feel about it. And uh, therefore you're, I think, <clears throat> you know, Wojciech was right. We have so many uh, Hungarian examples, but the German example is very powerful. And I think it does reveal a theme that can be ap uh, applied or perceived elsewhere in the world too. Uh, well, I, because being Bulgarian, of course, all the time I was trying to figure out uh, where countries like Bulgaria stay in all this. But the interesting story is it's not by accident that the two countries that feel culturally most self-confident in their Western identity, Hungary, Poland, and the Czech Republic for sure, were the one that's suffering most of it. Because what you're going to see on the example of countries like Bulgaria is something totally different. Basically, you do not have this type of ideological resentment. But for the last uh, 20 years, Bulgaria all the time was just trying to get the alternative changing the elites all the time. The country was basically twice for the last 20 years have a newly formed party winning the elections six months before the elections. First, it was the king. Now, uh, after that, it was the current prime minister, Borisov and others. So people were looking for a change. Uh, but paradoxically, they cannot get it. And they had never been ideologically articulated in the way you're going to have in Poland or Hungary. But uh, this was also due to the fact that countries like Bulgaria felt very much more insecure in our European identity. 
Uh, in a certain way, any moment when we're going to claim that we want to go ourselves, the fear was that it means that probably we're not European enough. While in Poland and Hungary and Czech Republic, for different reasons, you don't have this fear. I do believe this fear you can see in the Balkans, you can see this fear in Romania to a certain extent, and probably this explains why you have a much more ideologically covered type of resentment with this type of illiberalism that in the case of Orban ended up in his famous phrase when he said 30 years ago, the West was the model for them, now we are the model. But it was the refugee crisis and kind of a very uh, clear response coming from all Central and East European governments, which otherwise has a different political characteristics, they're different type of political regimes. But the idea is we're different, we don't want to be like you, we're not buying this, we're not going to imitate you on this that push us to make some of these universalizations, but where you're totally right. The smaller the country is, the more specific everything is in a strange way. With the small countries, you either know everything or you know nothing. And from this point of view, every universalization, of course, is quite a tricky one. Thank you. The next chapter and the next move ge geographically is Russia where the chapter is entitled Imitation as Retaliation. Again, imitation is the central theme, but it's a very different sort of imitation. Adam is as close to Russia, uh, maybe Ivan too. Yellow Russia. Adam is very close to Russia's toxic asset, as it was once called, Belarus, only a few hours away. And uh, he has some thoughts, reflections about Russia. Well, uh, thanks very much. I lost a bit of discussion precisely, probably due to the Lukashenko's interference, but uh, you know, <laughs> let's, let's, I prepared a few questions, but I will start with the first one. It means I found this part of, on Russia especially interesting. It means that, why? Because there's a, this imitation of the institutions combined with the foreign policies. That's rather unusual uh, approach. You distinguish three periods in the role of the democratic institutions in the Russian Federation since the dissolution of Soviet Union. But the crucial point, in your opinion, is a Putin speech in 2007, announcing more aggressive role of Russia in the global affairs. In the book, there is a, no description or analysis of the borrowed democratic institution. Instead, is a presentation of a different opinions of its potential impact on society in Russia and analysis of the gradual changes in the attitudes of Putin and ruling elites in relation to the West. It is a good example of political psychology and that's the key of my question. As you say, and there's the citation which I like very much, right? Your, it, the origin in political, origins in political psychology, not political theory, that's the origin of illiberalism in a philosophical sense is a cover story meant to lend to a patine a pati intellectual respectability to a widely shared visceral desire to shake off the column dependency. But perhaps political theory is more significant than that. You say that political psychology, but it's not clear that by the political theory, you mean theory of, by the political theory, do you mean the pol theory of political structures? So my questions, my question, which follow from this is whether that approach, it means political psychology approach is necessary only in relation to Russia or broadly speaking, Central and Eastern Europe and China, or is possible to apply globally. And let me explain a bit. It means reading your book, what came to my mind was a, rather old now book written by Mark Raev, means the well-ordered police state, in which he analyzed the modernization of Russia, Russian institutions during Peter the Great. And of course, the modernization was only on, but the outcome of this modernization was the enormous uh, consolidation of political in Russia. What Mark Raev didn't analyze was an uh, external expansion, territorial expansion of Russia after that modernization. So it seems to me that, that this ex ex external territorial ex expansion was basically the foreign policy. Therefore, what I think is necessary to take into account is also the political structure, not only uh, this element of political psychology. Answers, please. 
Uh, um, okay, so I'll say a few words uh, preliminary to Ivan's uh, more uh, substantial answer here. So uh, I think the, the idea that resentment, humiliation, uh, play a role in uh, uh, domestic and global politics is, uh, is a simple one, and it, I think it's, it's very powerful. And particularly in the Russian case, and maybe this is personal experience, but I, during the 90s when I was in Russia, I was watching many Americans there lecture Russians, and maybe a 25-year-old American graduate student was lecturing a Russian minister about how they had to live their lives and adapt themselves to, this was a case, not of imposition, but of the just annoyance. And there was a lot of just irritation at being told what to do and being told that, our, that you have to adapt yourself to the way we do things. And there was irony. And, you know, Surkov has that line, you know, uh, uh, capitalist democracy is just like a suit we put on on Sunday when we visit you, but then we come home and we, we dress the way we want to. This is, uh, it's all just uh, uh, pretended. You know, we, had, we have the, the argument that it was very easy for them to fake uh, liberal democracy because they've been faking communism for 20 years anyway. So they're faking away just to, uh, it, under, the, uh, under Western eyes, the way we look. But at the same time, there was a sense that there was, that there was something, there was a humiliation. Of course, a humiliation of the Soviet Union having broken up, of having lost their country. That was a, a big blow. Having lost it without having been militarily defeated. Uh, somehow, somehow they were betrayed. Uh, 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 start stab in the back narrative, maybe something was lost terribly. Um, and I think this focus, for, at least in my experience, the focus on those ridiculous lectures by visiting Westerners about how you have to be like us, created a focus on just the language of the West and the fact that the West was hypocritical. The West is talking values, but if you look at what the West itself is doing, it turns out it's not so ideal as it's presenting itself as. It has a lot of faults. It does things that, are, uh, that don't show respect for human rights. It's not as democratic as it says. All of those things, that, that, come, that focus, which is strange. Why does Russia care that Americans are hypocrites? You know, China doesn't care that Americans are hypocrites. That's just a battle between two powers. But Ru the Russian response to the end of the Cold War and the collapse of communism was focused on American hypocrisy what we're doing in Libya, what we did in Iraq, and so forth, what we did in Kosovo. There are a, a, a constant repetition on the, uh, a repeated focus on the contrast between the ideals that Americans uh, profess and the real motives and, uh, of their actions. So I think that's part of the, the Russian, uh, uh, our interest was explaining why that became such an important part of the rhetoric and when Putin uh, gave his speech about Crimea and the uh, independence of Crimea, he was almost repeating word for word the language that the Americans used about Kosovo. So that was a kind of imitative, but a sarcastic, ironic, aggressive form of displaying to the world how the Americans were two-faced. Uh, you know, you can't have a monopoly on double standards, something like that. But Ivan, please. I, I, I just want to continue from this because there is something extremely useful if you are taking somebody for being hypocritical. First, because it's always true. Nobody can basically live up to his ideas. But secondly, you can challenge uh, the international order or the power constellation without needing to have an alternative to it. And this is, in my view, interesting in the Russian case, because when we went to Russia and particularly interested what happened, unlike many people, we're not the one to blame basically what happened on the Western triumphalism, because honestly speaking, in the 1990s, there was not Western triumphalism. If you're going carefully to read the first books that had been published after the end of the Cold War, there was not the triumphalist titles. Brzezinski's book was called Out of Control. The West was very much worried that certain type of an order that was there is going to be replaced by disorder. And why we have been, of course, I mean, the West was very much fascinated and celebrated by the success of its own political system. I don't believe only after the, uh, the Kosovo War for, for a while, basically, this type of triumphalism came. And here was the interesting story about Russia. Uh, President Bush Sr. was very much afraid uh, to have the Versailles uh, syndrome with Russia. So all the time, 
the repeat, repeated sentence was, we want together, the West and the Russian people, the West and East European people. It worked very well for Eastern Europe because for Eastern Europe, it was much easier to frame the communist period as a kind of a foreign domination. It was a Soviet occupation. For the Russian, this easy explanation that communism was simply a Soviet occupation did not work. And secondly, there was a kind of a tension in the moment in which you called that you are a winner too. But on one level, of course, you lost your country. And this is something very difficult for many people to realize that for many Russians who hated communism, the loss of the Soviet Union uh, was a problem. But secondly, economically, socially, if you don't know anything that happened in the 1990s and you're just looking at the economic data, Russia was a defeated country. They lost one third of the economy. Of course, they lost territory. Seven years was the decline of the life expectancy in Russia in the 1990s. So this story that you are told all the time that you are victorious too, while you believe that basically you are the loser, this was the potential and the resentment that was mobilized by President Putin when he came. Getting out of your knees, the story that basically uh, we have been mistreated, we have been cheated, is what came as this type of trying to mobilize support all over. And one of the stories, and this is quite interesting uh, uh, for us, is to show that while in the beginning imitation was used very much as a defensive weapon, uh, this is kind of, we are democracy too, because of it, we're going to get some money from IMF. We are probably struggling democracy. We're going to do this and that. Suddenly, and this is where we do believe it was first very clearly articulated uh, in the Munich speech, suddenly the imitation became a very successful strategy at subversing liberal international order and American power in the world without presenting any alternative. Uh, and this is why you simply start mimicking, but this time mimicking was a parody. Uh, in a certain way, this was not the Soviet idea, we are better than you. The story was, we all are the same, but we are pretending that you're different. Everything is about power. And we find this very interesting because in time I'm going to end up on this. I was always uh, interested why the, the old communist elites in Soviet Union were so much unafraid in the 1990s of democracy coming, and part of it is that in a certain way, they really uh, started to think about democracy very much of what they have been uh, uh, reading about democracy in the Marxist textbooks, that it is a kind of a form of a class domination. Uh, and if you're the ruling class, there is nothing basically to worry about it. Uh, and this is why you're going to have an elections, but these elections are never going to change the government. So in a certain way, the elections is not representation of people. Uh, but this is the representation of government in front of the people and the way to control the people. For us, this was one of the important things to come uh, because it also shows how this kind of a global democratic rhetoric that we have been enjoying for three, 30 years had been instrumentalized by different political players for totally different purposes. And this kind of a subversive nature uh, of the Russian uh, policies was great for us because if the dream of the 1989 was that all are going to become like Americans. Russians are going to be like Americans. In a kind of a perverse way, it was realized during the 2016 election campaign when uh, the Russian uh, Twitter accounts pretending that these uh, Americans basically have been trying to convince the Americans for whom to vote on the American elections. So suddenly Russians became like Americans. They even became an Americans. They even voted on the American elections. With this, leads very nicely to what is perhaps the most counterintuitive, it seemed to me, uh, section of the book, and that is America itself. Imitation as dispossession. It's one thing to explain that people who've been forced to be uh, students get sick of being taught, and people who uh, have lost their country are uh, angered by that. But you have remarkably surprising analysis of how it is that in this age of imitation, where the United States is the chief imitatee or the chief thing that people are looking to, Trump appears partly as a person, partly as a representative of a big wave, and that's a wave of a very different sort. And it would be nice if you could explicate this form of imitation that you think has counter, again, I said counterintuitively, it, it seemed initially, 
uh, been so powerful and upsetting and unsettling in the American scene. Perhaps we start with the American. Yeah, so um, true. The, the, the Trump paradox, or the one way of talking about the radicalism of Trump, uh, the deviation, Trump's deviation from all previous precedents, is his, uh, pr he presents himself as the representative of the resentment of Americans to a world that uh, has imitated America and thereby humiliated America. That is, the, instead of the imitator uh, resenting the imitated, we have a case of the imitated resenting the imitator. And why is that? So I think we need to go back to the, really to the end of World War II to understand that Trump, Trump's own uh, way of viewing things, which of course is only important because he gained huge popular support by this. So after World War II, there was a decision uh, to uh, rechannel Japanese and German nationalism into away from militarism and into export-led industrialization, uh, which of course meant imitating the West. And uh, uh, Trump, who in the 19, late 1950s was writing, he never wrote about the Cold War, he never said anything negative about the Soviet Union, but he constantly attacked Germany and Japan. Why did he attack them? Because they were selling cars uh, in the United States. Even though we beat them in the war, why are they uh, competing against us so well? Because they imitated us and that he resented that. Now, when he first wrote about this, and the, when he was a real estate entrepreneur, people dismissed him as a clown, but somehow, when he emerged on the uh, political scene for many reasons, other reasons, this message, and particularly because China became a global competitor of the United States, which who was imitating us, borrowing our technology, and beating us, outcompeting us in many areas of uh, economic life. And that sense that China was both stealing our jobs and stealing our job destroying robots um, at the same time was uh, uh, something that resonated with both an economic elite and with workers who felt like their prospects for middle-class jobs had disappeared. So this was part of that sense that China is an imitator and its imitation has weakened us. Combine that with the idea that America, exceptionalism, America as a golden city on a hill was a magnet for immigration. We have a way of life that's superior to others we have more freedoms, we have greater opportunities. And this for Trump was a something sick about that because it was drawing people in from the rest of the world whom he thought, remember, Trump was a real estate, his father was, ran a, uh, you know, these housing projects in which the main idea was to keep the blacks out, keep have only white people inside the housing project. And he more or less projected that idea uh, onto the United States itself and appealed to you know, a, a diminishing uh, ethnic white besieged population who thought it was losing its heritage, who felt like a white lump of sugar in a brown cup of coffee, they were dissolving and losing their identity. He spoke to them and said, those people coming from outside are taking away your country. And they're taking away because they think you're uh, uh, a model of some kind. So the idea of being a model was something anathema. And he, that's the amazing thing about Trump, he can get in front of a crowd of people and say, America is not morally superior to other countries. America is not exceptional, it's not morally superior. And people will scream, USA, USA, that they, they respond to this somehow. So that's, it's such a bizarre um, uh, deviation. There's never been a president who has denied that America is morally superior to the rest of the world. That's just completely outside of American political development. So how do we explain it? I don't know that our explanation is the last word, but it's, I, I think we, if you focus on this, this version of, the, uh, of the, uh, the perversity of the imitation logic, you get at least part way to our, toward an explanation. Extraordinary, you have a line where you say that uh, he's announcing that he'll be the first president in American history to scrap the conviction that America stands for a teachable idea. That's again, another lapidary phrase. Ivan, do you, from a distance, have something to add to that? Uh, listen, for me, the most interesting, and of course, you're not going to be surprised that uh, the really interesting insights uh, uh, on America are not coming from me. 
Uh, but the, what was interesting thing from outside is that basically Trump went to the American people and said, you are told that this is the American made world, that we are winners. Do you feel like winners? And those who feel like the winners, they can vote for Hillary Clinton. And then he went to the white majority and said, do you feel as a winners? Do you feel the white privilege? If you feel it, you can vote for Hillary Clinton. So unlike in Russia, paradoxically, and this is why he feels so much psychologically uh, uh, close uh, to Putin, his major story was that people were, were lied by the elite that they are winners when in fact they were losers. And this idea of America the loser, that American people cheating by the elites was something that he was working on all the time. And this is quite interesting because if you're in business, the imitator is the worst competitor because he's taking all your competitive advantages in a certain way for free. So in the logic of people, somebody like Trump is, if democracy is so good, why are we giving to others for free? Why are they not paying for this? Everything that has values should be paid for like the American security guarantees and others. And for me, this is, comes at a moment in which a bigger group of the American society starts to question America's role in the globalized world. For example, the, we gave an example, which I want to repeat, and I do believe this is quite important, is if we talk 20 years ago, and we're going to try to give the most obvious example for the spread of the American soft power, of the American influence in the world, it's going to be the spread of English language. And everybody speaks English. Uh, it shows how important and how powerful America is. And then suddenly, America starts to understand that the spread of uh, English language is also American vulnerability. Because when everybody sp speaks English and understands America, you know how basically to influence America while America cannot influence others. Also, when America goes to other places, they start to speak to the English speakers only, and many of them do not speak for the majority of the population. So suddenly, America ended up in the world in which America is transparent for others. The world is not transparent for the United States. And this kind of a vulnerability was something that he was weaponized. Uh, and also for us was interesting uh, to show why people, listen, President Trump cannot be accused for being very truthful on what he's saying on factual level. And of course, even people who vote for him, they're not idiots and they see that he's kind of not staying very close to the facts. Why are they not offended by this? And I do believe that this was quite important that his major message to the voters was, listen, probably I'm lying to you about the small thing, but I'm very honest about the most important things, that everything is about me. Everything is about my interests while all other politicians are telling you that it is about you, and this is the big lie. And I do believe this cynical term, we are losers. I am, in order to be honest, and in order to be authentic, you should be cynical. You should be bad. You can trust only the bad guys. I do believe this was also kind of a cultural uh, term that came with, uh, with Trump and we changed very much the American policies because also he changed the idea of loyalty. Normally in democratic politics, you're loyal to the system and as a result of it, you can be critical to your own political parties, to your own representatives. Now what we have in the book is democracy of citizens was replaced by the democracy of fans. Basically, you should be totally uncritical in your loyalty. Trump does not expect people to be loyal to him when he's right. Being loyal is to be supported when you're wrong. But just let me, can I just say one other thing, Martin, just very briefly here, to relate it back to Wojciech, too. I, I think the Archbishop of Krakow has recently said that in 2050, the white people will all be in, on reservations, living on reservations. And this is, to the extent that that is a, a theme uh, of populism elsewhere in the world, that's very close to the thing that uh, Trump is, uh, is appealing to. I mean, Trump became a candidate by, uh, 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 because of Obama, basically, in a sense that uh, this, the one last remnant of white self-respect was the ability to look down upon blacks, and you very hard to look down on someone who went to Harvard, was so articulate, so intelligent. He, he came, he rode to power, Trump did, on the promise to humiliate Obama. That's what he was gonna do. And that really appealed to people because it was, and it was a sense of status, humiliation, resentment. It's not really about, you know, democracy of fans hardly means 
we, we, we support you even though we get no material benefit out of you. And I think that's, even though the business people get material benefits out of Trump, his voters don't. So why are they attracted to him? It's because he's telling them that I'm going to, uh, I'm going to praise the Proud Boys. I'm going to say they're good people uh, with uh, uh, waving a combination of Confederate and Nazi flags. And that's a, it's a, a question of retrieving or promising in some uh, uh, hallucinatory way uh, a reassertion of white uh, dominance. Oh, now, this has been the 30 years, but you say that the age of imitation is coming to a close, though paradoxically, by a different form of imitation, uh, not born of humiliation, or at least not trying to expiate humiliation, and that's China. And it will be, since our time is coming close to when we should try to see, to, to open up for questions and answers, could you tell us a little about that, but in the context of, well, it's tough to predict the future as we know, uh, but your speculations, because you say that, uh, I, it's another lovely phrase, uh, the future is an invasion from history, isn't it? Anyway, it's nicer than I've just... Uh, invasion of the unknown, yeah, exactly. Invasion of the unknown. So given that small qualification, could you tell us how this and why this age is closing in the way it is, and what you expect or, or speculate is likely to be the next range of possibilities of development? Listen, I'll start very briefly because, uh, uh, of course, listen, none of, uh, none of us is a specialist on China. Uh, and when we came with China, we wanted much more to make a theoretical argument, which was important for the book, than basically try to reveal uh, our knowledge on China. But what for us was very important is suddenly now we look back, it appeared that Tiananmen was not less important or probably more important uh, than uh, the Polish elections of uh, June of 1989. Uh, and the interesting story was, where was the China in all this age of imitation? And what we discovered is that while Chinese have been borrowing American technologies, uh, kind of a... Oops, we've lost, you are frozen. We do not want to be like the West. Uh, we're different. We even keeping the very much stressing their communist identity was to say, we are not going to be like you. Uh, and from this point of view, suddenly, we're now going to have a clash between the United States and China, between the China and the West. It's very clear, and many people try to see we're back to the Cold War. And uh, at least uh, my reading is, and uh, uh, I know that uh, Stephen is probably going to be more subtle on this, this is going to be a clash. And this is going to be about hegemony, and we see a very aggressive China. But there is one major difference between China today than Mao's classical communist China. China is not interested to transform the world. China is interested simply to dominate it. China coming to Bulgaria is not interested to have a political regime in which the replica of the China Communist Party is going to ride the country. They don't care who is in government until the government is going to do what China is interested to do. And I do believe from this point of view, it's different. It's also very much different that we have a capitalist authoritarian state, very much based on the big data. And from this point of view, China is much more threatening than the Soviet Union ever was, but this is not the second coming of the Soviet Union. Uh, and from this point of view, to think in terms of a classical oppositions between liberalism and totalitarianism and so on for us is much less productive because we're going to miss the novelty of the fact. But let's go to Stephen. Yeah, so just more or less elaboration on that. So the, the, the Chinese were, have been, since Deng, uh, imitating a Western uh, industrial organization, Western technology, scientific development, architecture, fashion, and so on, but not liberal democracy. So it was a particular kind of imitation that didn't involve, uh, involved means, but not ends, not, not converting to uh, uh, you know, Western lifestyles or beliefs in civil liberties and so on. Uh, so there was an imitative element, but not an imitation of Western democracy, of course, obviously. Uh, when our point here and the, the function of the chapter or the concluding chapter on China is that the, 
the, the coming war or battle or conflict, strife between the US and China or the West and China uh, is gonna be uh, world shaping, maybe world shattering, we're not sure, but it's not going to be a battle within the enlightenment between two regimes that seek to uh, create replica regimes around the world. That's, that's not the shape of, uh, of this new conflict. So it's different H how it's going to unroll. We're not arrogant enough to say that's what it's going to be like, but it isn't going to be that. And the phrase new Cold War, it can be used, but the Cold War was a very particular uh, a kind of conflict because it was a conflict, as, we, as many others have said, within the Enlightenment tradition. Uh, and when the Chinese are building roads and building ports and uh, making trade deals and bullying and telling people, if you harbor journalists who, uh, who criticize us, we're going to hurt you, which they are doing. I mean, there's a brutal bullying thing and, it's, and a definitely uh, a hostility to freedom of the press, let's put it that way. For, because, but not because they want uh, orthodoxy. It's not because they want foreign journalists to spout uh, Xi Jinping red, uh, ideology, Xi Jinping thought. They're not asking Australian journalists to subscribe to Xi Jinping thought. They're asking them to shut up and not reveal corruption and not reveal weaknesses of the regime. So that's there, but I don't think you can talk about that as an ideological uh, war. Or, and, and so there's indoctrination within China, for sure, but the shape of the global conflict is not a conflict between ideologies. At least that's a thesis, which could be disputed, of course. So it sounds like this is, though you don't say it in the book, a kind of back to the future thesis. We had an ideological century, the 20th century. It wasn't ideological before. It's now not going to be ideological again. Great powers will act as powers act. Is that too uh, unsubtle? Uh, well, it's not, no, I mean, it's partly, I, I think that's captured as part of our intuition. Of course, ideology in the sense of Western liberalism is an ideology and it does shape the way we try to organize our own societies and the ideals by which we judge ourselves uh, to be failing, <laughs> uh, which in, in the case of the United States is now the main function of liberalism. Uh, so that's there, and that's going to be a force in the world. And I don't, definitely, we're not, we're not, when we say the world, the, the age of liberal hegemony, the age in which uh, the U.S. and the West believed that its model was going to be replicated everywhere in the world, that seems to be over, partly destroyed by Iraq, Arab Spring, failures of various kinds, uh, also the, the turn against liberalism in Central Europe, a sense, there's a chastened sense that we're not going to succeed, European Union and also having a lot of problems. We're not the future. We don't own the future. But neither does populism, neither does anti-liberalism or authoritarianism own the future. All regimes have their, every form of order has its own forms of disorder. Every form of political regime creates discontent, creates resistance. And that's true in China. That's true with populists. And it's true with liberalism. So that, in a sense, this, uh, uh, the sense of uh, diversity, pluralism in the world has, has returned with, and where we are, I don't think we've, we're not, we haven't come to a point where liberalism is gonna be abandoned as an ideal, but we've definitely, we're entering into a new phase where this, uh, the, the political systems that are based on, on are aiming, are, are judging themselves according to liberal ideals are facing a very different context and one in which the uh, the project of exporting uh, democracy has ended. I'd Ken like Jowick has this, Ken Jowick has this beautiful uh, metaphor. He said, history normally is a Protestant. Different forms compete in forms, but they're Catholic moments in which one institutional form is tied to be conquering the world. And I do believe that 1989 was this Catholic moment in which uh, the liberal democracy was conquering the world. And now we're back to Protestantism. Well, tell the Taliban. Now, just before we finish uh, our, I'd like to move to Q&A, but just ask uh, the other two musketeers if they have anything to say in reflection at this moment. Bless you, Adam. 
I can't hear you. But I, I, yeah, I have something to say, but I'd rather open up the discussion for the general public. So unless okay. there are... We may have time to come back at the end. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, Carolyn, if you have any people on a list for Q&A, we could now open that list. But your music. I'm mute. mute. Sorry, I'm being bashful. Um, there was a question raised earlier that has been partly answered just in this last bit of discussion. Um, the question was, could the authors and or the commentators respond to the notion of the civilization state rejecting the liberal democratic model? But the, it was asked about China, for example, which you've been discussing, but also specifically about India and Iran. So I just wonder if any of you would like to add a comment following on from what was just being discussed, but vis-a-vis -vis India or Iran, perhaps. Do we have takers? Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll just make one, one point. And uh, listen, the interesting story is, and our book is very much focused on the Cold War, because this is our experience. This is a very much 1989 reassessing book. Uh, but now we realize that probably decolonization can turn to be more important for 21st century than the Cold War, because Cold War was much more Western European American story. And nevertheless, that it took parts in the different parts of the world. Uh, the civilizational state, the idea of the sovereignty, the idea of a cultural sovereignty, the idea of the sovereign democracy, which the Russians were talking about, came very naturally for some of the post-colonial societies. And for sure, the China civilizational state is we're going to be ourselves. We are not going to imitate the West, but because the imitation was something that they very much related to the colonial period that they hate. Uh, so from this point of view, I do believe this trend of uh, reassessing sovereignty, not simply in the legal terms, but very much as a kind of a cultural sovereignty, this strange story of authenticity. And this is part of the problem of the age of imitation. On one level, politically, you have the imitation imperative after 1989. You want to be like the West. But on the other side, you're living in a cultural environment in which the question was why we all are born kind of a unique, we all are dying as a copies. Just one comment about this. Um, the, humil the idea of humiliation as a political motivation was definitely true with China too. 100 years of humiliation, that's part of the, the whole idea. We're going we're gonna to reassert ourselves. We dominated the world economy for 18 out of the last 20 centuries, and we're coming back to where we were. This was a parenthesis, but it wasn't humiliation because we were imitating, and we were looked down as bad imitators. That, that wasn't the Chinese experience. While, for example, in many of the anti-colonial movements or decolonization movements, you see in France Fanon a very strong hostility toward mimicry. We're not going to imitate you anymore. So I think the Chinese, it's, it's not that humiliation, it's not an exception of the rule that humiliation is an enormous political motivator, national humiliation, uh, but it, 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 it doesn't belong to the story of humiliation through imitation. If you could just bear with me one second, we have some people who would like to ask a question. And what I will do is promote each person to panelists so that they can be seen by everybody. And uh, we'll start. Boyan, if you're ready, I will promote you now. So Boyan, if you can turn your video on. Yes, you're there. You're there. Okay. So uh, two points. First, um, congrats for fantastic book. It speaks directly to my own existential experience, 1989, traveling to Madison, Wisconsin, Cambridge, Massachusetts, writing a book, a dissertation with the title "From Plan to Market: One Way or Many," and I'll never forget uh, confronting the custom officers in the, Lo the Logan Airport who already know me at that time because I traveled so frequently and he would ask me the question, what are you looking at in Widener Library that you cannot find you know, back home you know, in trying to answer this question? So that was one experience. The second one, when I lived the academic life for a while and I worked as a chief negotiator for Slovenia's entry into European Union and I confronted on the other 
part of the table, the key European negotiator who happened to be from Italy. I was born very close to Trieste. So the idea of Central Europe spoke very directly to my heart, but the Italian guy who was from Northern Italy had no clue where Slovenia was on the geographical map and he was lecturing me on the you know, asylum law and so on. So, so that is my existential experience and I congratulate you for capturing so nicely the book. The second point is um, my current work on populism in the region. And here I find um, your book um, incomplete because I know that there is a, you say it in the, in the first chapter that you do not attempt to provide an overall theory explanation of the rise of illiberalism. You want to provide to focus on your own particular focus. But I find it a little bit difficult to understand how to explain this phenomenon without, you know, backing up your whole entire narrative with some other, you know, additional things which are going on in the region. Because I simply cannot see, you know, that people are joining Orban and Kaczynski and other because they want to resist copycats, you know, they want to resist copies. So, again, I know that you have disclaimer in the first chapter, but that there isn't simply much in the book which tries to, you know, adds to that aspect. So, so that's, I think it's a, 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 a unfortunate thing, but maybe you have, a, I don't know, but tell us what, what would be a factor that we left out? What, what would you focus on? Well, for example, you mentioned in discussion today, you know, you mentioned this, you know, the usual argument about Poland that why it's not the economy stupid because of this, you know, glorious, you know, golden age of, you know, Polish economy, which is a very, very partial explanation of that period. To have, you know, we learned by now that, you know, looking just at the GDP and then employment and the aggregate economic indicators tells only certain part of the story. You have another part, which is a huge split in Poland, you know, um, rich Warsaw, you know, and the Eastern part completely differently affected by the whole integration and, you know, and many other things. So but you're saying economic, economic, economic disparities is what you're talking it, about. It's, it's, it's very complex. It's very complex. I, you know, I, I know both your arguments. I know that Ivan, you know, doesn't like very much, you know, the political economy argumentation. It's, I, I read his work, you know, in importance of immigration, but I think it's both. The point is, you know, not, I'm not trying to say which is the correct one. I, I want to bring it, to bring these things to the, to the own, you know, copycat uh, explanation. Yeah. Can I add something? You're right, you're right on this, but here's the interesting story about Poland. If you go on the opinion polls, more than 70% of the polls are going to declare you that they're satisfied with their personal lives. This is not about, so you have this strange story in which people are declaring that they're satisfied with their personal lives and at the same time they're totally outrageous uh, and saying how their revolution has been stolen, how the transition has been wasted. So it's not that I don't like the political economy argument. I simply believe that there are people who are making the political economy argument much better than me, so, which is different. But we said, is there something that is missing in this? And of course, in many countries, the economic argument is so strong enough, that probably you don't need any more. So this is, uh, you, you know, this uh, beautiful uh, joke. I'm going to contribute a joke, not a, uh, not a theory on this, but this is a joke about the pilgrim who went through a village. And he noticed that basically the bell in the church uh, is not ringing. So he asked a local person, he said, but why the bell is not ringing? And the guy said, listen, there are a thousand explanations for this, but let's start with the fact that there is not a bell. Uh, so... <laughs> In some countries, probably the economic explanation is enough. But this is why for us, Poland was so interesting. And on the other side, it was the Orban's ambition to come with an alternative model that made, of course, Hungary so central to our, uh, to our work. Wojciech, you had something to say. But you're muted, you're muted. I would like very much follow up uh, bo uh, and, and, and concur to Boyan's uh, observation. So, let me just go back to Ivan's uh, statement earlier that economy stupid does not apply to Poland. Here I fully agree. And also I, I think I rely on the same sources like Maciej Gdula's uh, argument, which you also referred to in your book. So I think that, and here I may slightly disagree with Bojan, that economic uh, disparities and uh, wrong distribution of the fruits of the transition is a very weak explanatory factor of the rise of populism in Poland. 
But from this, it does not follow that therefore imitation resentment is, uh, is, is the only alternative or is the best explanatory factor. I mean, there may be the whole set of factors which are more of the ideological subjective agency related factors rather than structural uh, about xenophobia, uh, nativism, fear of the modernity, and attempt, you know, religious strength, etc., which have nothing to do with anti-imitation in the sense that they are exactly the same as the sources of power of Marine Le Pen or of Mr. Salvini. They are also nativist and xenophobic, etc., and anti-Western liberal, but not because of the imitation. So, you know, when I, or imitation, angst or anxiety or resentment. So when I look at Poland, I mean, you must look at public discourse, at books, at public opinion, at, you know, what people say in the newspapers. And maybe I'm talking to the wrong people and looking at the wrong places, but I hardly see any examples or instances of this anxiety, anger, and resentment about imitation. I rather see lots of xenophobia, which are very much like I see in the West and which probably have the same sources, but the imitation anxiety is the least of them. Well, I don't, uh, so how is Balsarovic viewed in Poland? I mean, it's a, uh, we're talking about what is the resentment against the reform generation of elites? Where, where does that come in? The people who said, like our friend Alex Smola, you know, he said, imitation is what we have to do. That's the whole project, imitate. And, we have, and it's going to be institutional reform by imitation. That was their language. So I don't, you, you never heard resentment against imitation in Polish discourse? That's not possible, Wojciech. I mean, you're like, that is really, is, you're, you're exaggerating. And I think it's because you believed in the imitation project. And you still believe in it. It sounds like you still believe it. But the problem here is not that this was not the source of resentment. It's that you feel like that resentment is illegitimate because you don't think the imitation project really did something wrong. So I, I don't think we disagree with that. It's what the question is whether or not that sense that that reform elite was caving in to foreign models and that anything that went wrong in your life or any sense of dis of disorientation, the fact that your children are leaving the country, uh, or, or that uh, uh, the young people uh, don't want to don't want to stay, whatever the source of uh, unease, which is not necessarily economic misery, of course, but there's many sources of disappointment and dis uh, disillusion, and this counter elite, this populist counter elite, managed to focus attention on the fact that our Polishness has been assaulted. Now, of course, it's assaulted also by immigrants. Uh, uh, but it's immigrants and Brussels. It's immigrants and the West. It's the, and there's a kind of an alliance between Brussels and this fantasy world of those who are bringing diseases across borders, you know, coming in to destroy the authentic Catholic Poland. But of course, obviously, you got, uh, you, you, all of you know, I mean, Yvonne, of course, knows much more than I do, but uh, you guys know much more than both of us. So uh, I would defer, but I don't, I don't think this, the complete dismissal of the language uh, of, uh, of, of the resentment of being copied, being copies is, I think that's a, you're going too far. And I, I, I know some of the concerns that Adam has had, and one of them to do with the presence of the past is one that I share. So I wonder if Adam could uh, voice that concern and maybe I'll put a footnote on to it. Well, when I, uh... In my opinion, anyway, it, it sort of dismiss the past, right? It means the past uh, of those countries. It means so sort they of focus on, on this resentment at the moment. But uh, well, it means there's a plenty of arguments which we possible to put forward. But I just want to use only examples, right? It means uh, about this sort of the psychological or unconsciousness of the past. So, if we look at the or the territorial organization of the solidarity in 1881. Surprisingly, it reminded the sort of the self-organization of nobility in the form which was called in Polish Rokosz. If you look at Maidan at the same time, it means Maidan in Kiev, the organization there of people, it means quite recently, remind the organization of the Cossacks. It means that, you know, the 
10, 100, and so on. And that was totally dismissed, it seems to me, in the, in, uh, in the book. Martin? Can I just try to generalize that point a little? Uh, because it seems, and, and I've said this to, to Stephen uh, when the book was being written, that there's a kind of, it's, it's a question about the status of the claims that, for imitation, that there's a kind of systematic ambivalence in the book, or if not systematic, then a kind of tugging in the one direction where you say, and you do say several times, that uh, this is only one part of a complex story, it's about many places, uh, we just want to focus on this. But then again and again, except with China, you set up imitation, not just as another thing, but as much more important than hostile paths, illiberal paths, Russian traditions of autocracy, God knows what. I don't know why the evidence, I don't know how the evidence forces that, and some of the evidence might be what Adam has just said. I think it's something from within you, and something which charms me about the book is the patterns are so well described, and then I wonder, do I not see them because you're just so much smarter than I am, which is a problem. <laughs> or, or is it because you need to find a certain pattern and, and you don't like explaining things? It is always a plausible. It is always a plausible hypothesis, Martin. I know. Thank you, my friend. No, no. But listen, Before Martin. You you have a very, Martin, you have a very good point. And the story is when we started to write the book, we didn't start to write to be the first one writing the only book about this. And there were two types of an interesting explanations that were already there. One was economic. And listen, we are taking much more seriously uh, economy than normally you basically uh, uh, should, uh, should believe. Uh, but secondly, it was very much based on the historical experience. But for us, what's very important to show that what is happening in Central and Eastern Europe was not a Central European phenomenon. For us, it was very interesting to try to see certain type of resentment that was based on an exceptional nature of the post-Cold War period. This is why we probably overworked our intuition, but this was not a book about Central Europe only. This was not a book about Russia only. We do believe that there was a global moment, and this global moment was very much rooted in the very exceptional nature of the post-Cold War period. So this is why, while we are kind of quite aware uh, that you have a very strong historical patterns and that they are present and uh, people have been writing extremely uh, convincingly about it, we decided to make this our argument because it also goes with our intuition that there was a specific period for the last 30 years, which was a global period. And we should not look at what is happening in Poland as a Polish problem, what is happening in Hungary as a Hungarian problem. This is not the crisis of democratization. We are seeing the crisis of liberal democracy. So this is why we're so much basically overstressing this, but you are absolutely right that we are overstressing it. No doubt on this. So can I, can I say on this issue, we have a question by Jan Zielonka, our friend who has just Precisely on the issue mentioned by Ivan a moment ago. So can, can Yannick uh, maybe be elevated to the status of participants and-, That's and a, I've been just trying to jump in and do that voice. Okay, but good, thank you. We have thank questions you. flooding in. So let's go- um, can, But can you, can you, can you yes. give the floor to Jan Zielonka? Because yes. this is exactly a follow up, I think on Ivan. If I could find him in the attendees list. No, but his question is in Q&A section. Yes, yeah. it is. If, the, the question that Jan asks is, if imitation is responsible for the anti-liberal surge in Eastern Europe, how do you explain a similar surge in Western Europe? He's writing from Italy where Salvini is a great pal of Urban and is using similar rhetoric. Steve, you were p planning to answer anyway, so could you bring yeah, I mean, of course, this is a, a I mean, the, the, the parallels between Salvini and, uh, and East Central European populism is very interesting. We didn't write about it. I have some opinions, but I think the main point I would want to make is that the, the two leading uh, approaches to the, the populist in, populism in Central Europe question were neoliberalism. That's the root of all evil. Everything has to be explained by the fact that uh, Thatcherite, Reaganite, 
liberalism was different than the kind of Keynesian, Rooseveltian liberalism that was exported in 45. There is something to this. And the other was Return of the Repressed. Return of the Repressed is that 1989 was just a parenthesis and there was a reversion to what there was before. So the society basically, it's in the DNA, authoritarianism, populism is in the DNA. Now, of course, this is kind of methodologically a very weak uh, approach to the world to say that the way things are now is because they remind me of the way they used to be. That's just thinking by analogy. That's not a historical argument. And, and uh, I think it's certainly the fact that people who studied the past, this is a natural uh, effect of scholarship. If you know something very well, you overestimate its importance because it's the thing you spent your life studying. So if you study the past of Central and Eastern Europe, you're gonna say, that's why it is the way it is today. I would say that's a kind of a psychological factor. It's not that it's irrelevant, but I don't deny that. But we're trying to say, what was it about the way 1989 unfolded that had a causal effect upon what happened as, a, as an independent causal factor? And if you say just it's reversion to the way it always was, you're gonna miss that. I think that's our, our main idea. And this is kind of idea that imitation plays a role. It's not the only role, it's not the only factor. And of course, there are resentments against modernization, resentments against changing gender roles. And of course, that also could be imitative. That is, what should we in Poland imitate uh, LGBT rights that are very prevalent in the West? Should we do that? What does that do to us? Uh, so this is, it's both, it's kind of a nativist resentment. And you find that, uh, you know, op openness uh, to, uh, to uh, foreigners uh, coming from the rest of the world. Should we be doing that? That's a kind of uh, anti-discrimination law. We, should, uh, we shouldn't be discriminating. We should be universalistic. All of that is resentful, is resentment, but it also has an imitation element. And I think it's, we're not denying that neoliberalism on the one hand and national traditions have an effect, but uh, uh, the neoliberalism uh, hypothesis doesn't get to the psychological uh, elements. The humiliation and the resentment doesn't get to that. And the uh, uh, the return of the repressed argument doesn't get to the role of the way 1989 happened uh, in what happened later. It's just, it's too uh, crude uh, as, as an explanation. Carolyn, can you, perhaps, Jan is on the screen. Is, are you participating, Jan? We can hear you now. There you go. Yeah. Well, I cannot oh, yeah. say. My question was simple. I don't think uh, Stephen has answered it, but, uh, but you know, because I see similar phenomenon with local variants across Europe, I, I'm not talking about the US now. Uh, I ask myself, how come that in more or less the same period, the same anti-liberal search takes place? And it's very difficult to, to, to argue that uh, Salvini is here because of, of uh, post-45 imitations in Italy. Uh, I, I think if I would have to give an answer is because uh, liberals betrayed, liberals became ideology of power and liberals were running governments and making uh, mistakes for which they are paying a price, you know, saying one thing and doing another. And part of the story is, is economics, uh, no liberal economics. And as a true liberals, you can say uh, this is not liberalism as, as I understand it. Part of this is, uh, uh, you know, too much emphasis on individuals uh, and, and neglect what Stephen actually, uh, how many years ago, Stephen, 30 or 40 years ago, you know, argued that liberals should have strong communitarian roots, right? Uh, ignoring the notion of community. A part of this was, you know, a, a policy which, which was uh, totally disgraceful against uh, and uh, anti-liberal. I mean, uh, it, these were not populists who, who you know, who, who were in power uh, when, when we basically went to Libya without a UN mandate or where we made a deal with Erdogan to put migrants in the <laughs> in the detention camps and that kind of things. All of this has been done by us uh, as liberals in government. 
so, so we are paying the price. There is a, a simply a price to be paid for, 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 for this. And liberals, which became as ideology of the oppressed, became at certain moment liberal uh, ideology of those in power uh, and, and with no alternatives. And, and when it happens, you get resistance. And there is resistance to this across the board. And it, it manifests itself in different forms in different places because all those countries are somewhat different. And I think here I very much agree with Wojtek with what applies to Hungary doesn't have to apply to Bulgaria or East Germany. In East Germany, by the way, Stephen, I think there is more talk about hegemony rather than imitation there than in, in East Germany. Uh, okay. okay, I mean, I, I, you're right, of course, in many ways, but I, I, I don't, I think it's a, there's a little bit too much of the, the sinful will be punished in what you just said, that we, we made sins, that liberals were sinful, and therefore they're going to be punished. Well, if you look at Italy, I mean, who are the great liberals? Andriotti, Berlusconi, Croxy, who are these great liberals you're talking about that were resented? Uh, and I think if you want to look at an analogy, uh, there's a youth outflow, uh, young, talented people from Italy are leaving. The population is very stagnant. There's a sense that areas where uh, uh, the population, basically you're having no children. Uh, as the immigration becomes a, 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 a kind of neuralgic issue when population is declining. That's a very kind of analogous thing. But this, that language of, uh, uh, and the resentment against Brussels, very powerful in Italy. Is that against liberal Italian leaders? Um, uh, the sense that the Euro really reduced people's uh, spending power, uh, the sense that they've lost control of uh, things. So I'm not, I'm really, I'm not exactly uh, uh, understanding your causal uh, analysis here, but the ana I, we definitely did not write a book about Italy. That's first one thing for sure. Uh, and I'm sure if we had uh, tried to do it, we wouldn't have succeeded. But uh, I think exploring the analogies is a great thing. Uh, and, uh, and again, the, f the fact that we're using imitation, I think the phrase Ariadne's thread is a good one. We're trying to, we're taking a concept which helps us tie together phenomena that otherwise you don't see. We're trying to tell a story. It's not the only story you could tell. But it does reveal, it does open some windows, some doors onto certain aspects of this global danger to the liberal or global uh, state of siege under which liberalism is living uh, that otherwise would be hidden. Can I make just one a very brief point? I do believe where Jan is very right is that after 1989, everything became liberalism. Exactly because the Cold War was over because there was not simply a confrontation between Soviet Union and the West, but as a result of it, there is no really confrontation between left and right in Western democracies because they moved to the center. Then suddenly uh, everything was liberalism. I'm always going to remember that in the mid 1990s, there was an old Roma lady uh, who was starting uh, blaming something for the democratic transition and the colleague of mine told her, but 60% uh, of this time, it was the ex-communist party that was in power. And she said, everything after 1989 is democracy, including the communists themselves. And I do believe this is the nature of the period. Suddenly liberalism stopped to be a specific ideology among any others, and it became the libel of a period in which you have globalization, in which you have this, you have that. Uh, and because it became common libel, you have the feeling that you should do the same thing. Uh, and also on the urban, uh, 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 on urban Saldini story, I do believe that they have a common sources, but also don't forget, this is the imitation on the other side. Orban is simply doing fine politically. He's winning elections all the time. And because Salvini is very much interested to do the same, he's doing kind of a imitation on the other side. Basically, you're imitating the success the success of a language, the success of a political strategy, and don't forget the diploma work of Mr. Orban won on Gramsci. So in a certain way, this was an Italian <laughs> influence on Hungarian politics and <laughs> Carla. Yes, we have someone else who'd like to speak. Um, Jan, uh, Yuri, excuse me. Yuri, so, Yuri yes, what you yeah. said. Can, I, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, yeah. excellent. Yeah, okay. 
Hello and hello and thanks a lot uh, for a great talk, great discussion. The book is here. Uh, <laughs> I love it so much, and uh, I just want to join briefly with my um, doubts about the imitation thesis because uh, we heard some arguments, and nowadays in Europe there is hardly anything to imitate by and. Um, <laughs> Uh, if you want Good to point. imitate Brexit, uh, you, you name it. Um, but, uh, I liked um, Ivan's uh, comment about decolonization, and it reminded me that um, uh, in Central Eastern Europe, this is typically used, this is the discourse used by right-wing populists, Orban raging against moral imperialism of the EU, or a Czech anti-EU populist saying we are treated like a colony of Brussels and they export everything. So uh, it, uh, to generalize briefly on it, aren't we rather experiencing um, a grievance of authentic, authentic grievances of cultures against what is perceived as the system and the center of civilization, which we call enlightenment and light of liberal democracy. And uh, uh, in this sense, uh, isn't it only an expansion uh, and linking it to constitutional populism 30 years ago, Zygmunt Bauman was warning against those who lost in globalization competition. And those who lost create explosive communities. It's his concept. Aren't we rather experiencing that today there's more and more explosive communities lurching into the constituent power of we, the people, our identity is betrayed and we want to recreate it, reconstitute it. Just, that's excellent. I, what you made me understand is that there is a kind of imitation of decolonization in Central Europe, which wasn't the same experience. I, I had a, a, someone I knew, a lawyer in Budapest who was a member of the Jobbik party and she used to wear a Palestinian uh, uh, you know, scarf. Uh, he said, we are the Palestinians, uh, and this kind of thing. So that's a, I think that's a very good uh, uh, example of the fact that the concept of imitation, what makes it useful is that it has so many sides and you can, you can turn it in different ways. <clears throat> and just uh, one elaboration on that point that because you were talking about Belarus <clears throat> earlier, uh, Putin is afraid that his own people will imitate Maidan. So that's, there's a fear of imitation. That is, you can, you can see that imitation is a, is a force uh, in the world. It's not a force that necessarily explains what politics is, but people don't like it. I mean, people in ruling autocratic countries don't want their people to imitate. And that's a, that's a reality. So this is, the, the point about the concept of imitation, it's not an explanatory, it's not a, an explanation of what happens. It's a it's a tool we can use to explore different aspects of what's going on in the world. Martin, because I should run to the airport, but in my view, there is something extremely important, and this is goes both where Jan and Irji go. The globalization of the world created a situation in which imitation is like infection. You're kind of a very vulnerable to ideas and things coming outside of your tradition, your community, outside of your borders and how you're protecting yourself. You're coming with this violent idea of authenticity and identity, which is trying to close the borders that cannot be closed. For example, you cannot close the information borders. You cannot close this, you cannot close that. But this creates this very strong outrage, but this is the outrage coming of the world that you don't understand anymore. This is a strange story in which you're freer than before, but you feel less powerful. And I do believe this discrepancy between freedom and power is quite interesting. In our normal political story, people get freer when they get more power. And suddenly you're much freer. You can do th things that you can never do before. But you have this loss of power. And I do believe this is what is interesting about the definition of losers. They're not simply a classical economic losers. They're losing something else. And this is why we have been so much basically attracted by this imitation story. I want to uh, basically uh, excuse myself, but if I don't go to the airport, I don't believe that I'll be able to imitate flying without a plane. 
<laughs> Before you go, I should advertise, because I had hoped to raise this issue in, in the discussion, there were many, but Ivan has a book that comes out in Kindle on the 29th of October and comes out in February, which is called, Is It Tomorrow Yet? Paradoxes of the Pandemic. And that I would have loved to continue in this discussion. I fear, I said we could keep going and it's obvious we can, but I fear that we, if only to allow uh, Ivan to get to the airport, um, Stephen to get to sleep, Wojciech to get to court, and <laughs> me to get to the bottle, which is just at the other side of the computer. Uh, I think, Carolyn, is it, is it appropriate to shut up shop? Martin, we have a list of questions that is uh, unbelievably long, and some of them are very complex. But what I can say is that I'll provide the questions to Stephen and Ivan, and they can consider them uh, further as they... Uh, and perhaps if there's a way, because the chat sheet, I don't know what happens tomorrow, can people log in again to read those questions? Um, it, that is difficult, but if anyone is interested in the other questions, they can drop me an email. And if I lean the right way, you can see my email address there on the screen. Um, the other thing is we had some questions also for Wojciech. Uh, I'll send them to Wojciech and, and, uh, with the details of who asked them. Um, but I think we would need to be here until midnight Sydney time to go through all the questions. So from that point of view, I think it's excellent that we've been able to promote that level of um, interaction. Well, I just want to thank everybody, everybody who came to listen, most of all, uh, Ivan and Stephen, and to some extent, Wojciech and Adam as well, uh, and <laughs> Carolyn, <laughs> Carolyn, who holds the whole show together. And the Izzy, and the Izzy and the Ann who stay with us. Indeed, <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh, all thank right. you all, thank and you. it was lovely Thanks. to see you again. And we'll do this, we hope, soon in some on some other some thank post, you. post and we're going to have a post pandemic party when all this is over. Well, I yes, sir. Am, mine will be so <laughs> absolutely. Good night, and good night. Right. Bye now, Bye, everybody. Bye.